Today is September 1st. As I was walking to the center this morning, I felt it was the most beautiful morning of the whole year. Uh, summer is ending and fall is right around the corner. It's time to pray for fall semester and for harvest of souls in this new semester and a wonderful time to study John's gospel and listen to Jesus' words. Today, my message title is, The Truth Will Set You Free. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your great love in Jesus, love that sacrificed your own son as a ransom for us, love that shone your light into the darkness and reached down and took hold of each of us to draw us out of the darkness and into your marvelous light. We come to you to listen to you and have fellowship with you. Father, please speak to our hearts. Help each of us hear your voice and accept your word. Please enable me by your grace to deliver this message. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our key verses today are verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. May we read these verses together, please? To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Today's key verse ends with the word free. We love the word free. Would you say with me the word Free. free. We feel good when we say that word. As the 50th anniversary of the March of Washington has come, many have remembered Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. I like that speech a lot. In his speech, He's talking about freedom from racial oppression. And there are many kinds of freedom. The First Amendment mentions freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, petition, and assembly. These freedoms are precious to us. We're willing to sacrifice in order to gain them and to keep them. But in this passage, there is a deeper, more significant freedom, one that we cannot attain by our effort or ability. It is freedom from sin and freedom from death. This is the most important kind of freedom. In today's passage, Jesus teaches us how to obtain this freedom. It comes from knowing the truth. From what? The truth. Yes. The key word in this passage is truth. May we say it together? Truth. It appears seven times. Jesus speaks the truth. Jesus is the truth. We can divide today's passage into two parts. In verses 31 through 36, Jesus teaches us how to know the truth and the consequences of knowing the truth. In verses 37 to 59, Jesus contrasts 
the truth that comes from God and its characteristics with the lies that come from Satan and their characteristics. Let's listen to the truth. Amen. So that we may have real freedom. Real freedom that only Jesus gives. First, knowing the truth and its consequences. At the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus had declared, I am the light of the world. There were two responses. Many Jewish leaders remained in pride and unbelief and remained in the darkness. But some people humbly accepted Jesus' words. They believed in him. But Jesus did not entrust himself to them. He wanted them to take root in his word and grow. So he said in verses 31 and 32, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In these verses, there are three phrases that we need to think deeply about. One is, hold to my teaching. Another is, know the truth. And third, the truth will set you free. In the first place, hold to my teaching. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. What does hold to my teaching mean? The words hold to are from the Greek word meno. This word meno appears again in verse 35 two times and is translated permanent place and belongs. It appears again repeatedly in chapter 15 and is translated remain. Hold to implies taking firm hold of something, firm grasp of something, firm grasp of something, without being moved in the face of resistance. When strong winds blow, we need to hold something that is firm and secure. Otherwise, we'll go off course. When the strong winds of temptation, relativism, and human philosophies blow, we must hold on to Jesus' word all the more firmly. By holding on to his word, we can take root in Jesus. When we take root in Jesus, our souls are nourished and we grow. The point of hold to my teaching is to have a vibrant personal relationship with Christ. That is why the Greek word is also translated remain, remain in me. If we really want to know Jesus, we must hold on to his teaching in every season of life, while young or old, in sickness, and in health, in times of failure, as well as times of success, during storms, as well as calm, during trials, as well as blessing. Then we can really be a disciple of Jesus, that is a learner of Jesus. We can grow in his image and in his character. We can become a little Jesus and spread his fragrance wherever we go. In the second place, know the truth. If we become disciples of Jesus, we know the truth. Usually when people refer to truth, they mean fact or reality. The antonym is falsehood, 
But here, to know the truth is to know God and his word. The truth is characterized as being unchanging, everlasting, universal. It is applicable to all people in all places at all times. Where is such a thing? Everything in the world changes. The value systems and ideas that guide the world change constantly. If we study the history of music, we can find tremendous shifts over time. Believe it or not, at one time, classical music was dominant everywhere. We heard a beautiful example of this at our summer conference when the orchestra played and prayed and played and prayed together <laughs> under the guidance of uh, Elder Jim Rarick. That's one kind of music. But now, freestyle, dynamic, interactive, feeling-oriented, loud music is very popular. It requires a lot of energy, and older people have trouble appreciating it. <laughs> Until the last few centuries, marriage meant a social agreement between families with little or no regard to how the bride or groom felt. In our time, marriages are seen to provide emotional and physical nourishment so that both parties feel that their needs are being fulfilled. In the past, people believed that there was an absolute truth that applied to all people universally. But today, due to the influence of postmodernism, many feel absolutely that there is no absolute truth. My point is that everything changes in the world. But one thing never changes, God and his word. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25a say, for all people are like grass. Please turn to your neighbor and say, you're like grass. <laughs> That's only part. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen. Jesus and his word never change. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. When we hold to his teaching, we experience Jesus, who is eternal and unchanging. We come to know the truth and have a sure foundation of life in his word. This is amazing. In the third place, the truth will set you free. People long for freedom. They want to live as they please without restriction or limitation. The prodigal son thought he would be happy if he left his father and abandoned morality and indulged in his uh, flesh with money. But he ended up in miserable bondage. Real freedom, real freedom can only be enjoyed in the truth. For example, fish can enjoy freedom as long as they swim in the water. 
to fish, water is not a restriction. It's necessary for swimming. In the same way, we human beings can enjoy freedom in Jesus, not away from Jesus, in Jesus. Jesus' words are not words that bind us. They're words that set us free. The woman in chapter 8 is one example. And there are many others. Yesterday, in her baptism testimony, Ruthie Thompson shared that she had been bound by meaninglessness and sinful desires, especially last year. And then she read Romans 3, 22 to 24. She heard Jesus' word, words of love and forgiveness, that he had forgiven her freely by his grace, that he had given her eternal life. In that moment, all the darkness vanished, and she was free in Jesus. Then through 1 Peter 2, 9, Jesus called her a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Tomorrow she returns, or next week, a week from tomorrow, she returns to her mission field, Russia, with great hope and vision. Jesus' words do not bind us. They are words that set us free. Upon hearing Jesus' teaching, the truth will set you free. The Jews protested. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Actually, they lied. They had been slaves. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and presently Rome. They could not say they had not been slaves of anyone. It came from their pride as Abraham's descendants, God's chosen people. They reveal a concept of freedom that was political, social, economic, and military. Jesus did not correct them with a history lesson. Rather, he exposed the tragedy of their present bondage and invited them to the freedom they really needed. He said in verse 34, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Here Jesus explained the nature of sin. It binds people and makes them slaves. When counseling Cain, who confronted the power of sin, God told him, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. Sin is like a crouching lion, ready to pounce on its prey and devour. People think, oh, sin is enjoyable not knowing the power of sin. When we know the power of sin, we cannot enjoy sin freely. Karl Heim, an influential 20th century theologian, said, sin is like a prison cell. We have a key to enter it freely, but once we enter, we cannot get out. We have no key to escape. We are bound. This is why the thought, I will just try it once, is so deadly. Because trying it once leads to a bondage that we never expected. How can we escape from the bondage of sin? In verse 35, Jesus explains that we need a change in status from slaves to family members. 
he said, Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. A slave's status in a family does not change. No matter how hard he works or how his condition improves, he might become a tutor or a manager, but not a family member. However, a son belongs to the family forever, even though he makes many mistakes. Moreover, a son as heir has power to adopt slaves into the family. Jesus applied this to himself. He said in verse 36, So, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus, the Son of God, can set us free from the bondage of sin. Only Jesus, who is the truth, can change our status from a slave of sin into a child of God. To do so, Jesus gave his life as a ransom on the cross. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 say, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ. Many prestigious American universities, including Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Northwestern, were founded primarily for training ministers of the gospel. But these days, these institutions are more secular than sacred in nature. Students go there to pursue many kinds of truth, philosophical, scientific, psychological, economic, and so on. These truths are important and valuable, but they cannot set us free from the power of sin and death. Many students who have a brilliant grasp of truth in one way or another are still living in darkness. Many are slaves of greed or pride or sexual immorality. Many are addicted to alcohol or drugs and trivial pursuits. They are suffering from wounds due to unhealthy family life. The truth they gain in university cannot save them from these things. So many are desperate and even consider suicide. Others, as Thoreau said, live lives of quiet desperation. They really need the truth. They need Jesus. They need Bible teachers who can share the word of God with them and show them the way to Jesus. This is why we teach the Bible to students. Let's pray to share the truth of Jesus with many students on the Chicago area campuses in this new fall semester. Second, the source and characteristics of the truth. Though Jesus had shared life-giving words, the Jews did not accept them. In fact, they reacted to Jesus out of their pride that they were Abraham's descendants. In verse 37a, Jesus acknowledged their claim However, it was true only in a physical sense. In terms of faith and spirit, they did not do what Abraham did. On the contrary, 
their hearts were full of murderous desire. Jesus was telling them what he had seen and what he had heard in the Father's presence. But the Jews were listening to and imitating a different father. They claimed that their father was God himself. But they did not love Jesus, whom God sent. They were unable to hear Jesus' word because they belonged to their father, the devil. Jesus described the devil in verse 44b. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. The devil tears down, destroys, and kills. He is violent. In order to destroy, he lies. Often his lies are disguised as half-truths. On the other hand, God gives life, protects, builds up. God always tells the truth. God is sacrificial, kind, and merciful. In order to give life, God gave his one and only son, to sinners. By contrasting the father and the devil, Jesus exposed the motive and action of the Jews. They claimed to be God's children, but they lived like the devil's children. Finally, Jesus challenged them. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Then Jesus explained that they did not hear Jesus' word because they did not belong to God. At this, the Jews became irrational. They badly insulted Jesus, calling him a Samaritan and demon-possessed. But Jesus was not irrational. He said, I am not possessed by a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Jesus was seeking God's glory, not his own. This Jesus did not give up on the irrational Jews. Out of his great shepherd's heart, he proclaimed, Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word, will never see death. What a great promise. Who can say this? Since Adam's fall, no one has cheated the power of death. Death has overpowered all people without exception, rich and poor, powerful and powerless, educated and uneducated, noble and ordinary, beautiful and plain. What is worse, before dying, we must suffer from death's elements, fatalism, meaninglessness, powerlessness, sorrow, and fear. How can we not see death? Yet, Jesus said, whoever obeys my word will never see death. When we obey Jesus' word, we cross over from death to life. Jesus' words, the words of truth, set us free from the power of death. Those who hold to Jesus' words will enjoy true freedom and taste eternal life. At this, the Jews exclaimed, Ha! Now we know you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, whoever obeys your word will never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? 
Well, Jesus told them, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. On hearing this, the Jews were shocked and said, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. As we studied last week, these words, I am, refer to God himself. Jesus boldly, plainly declared, he is God. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. As we look back on verses 37 through 59, we find that the word Father appears 13 times. Essentially, there are two fathers mentioned. One is the Father God, and the other is the devil. The Father God is the source of life and truth. The devil is the source of murder and lies. All truth and all life comes from the Father God and belongs to him. Since God is truth, we can be sure that he will keep his promises. It is impossible for God to lie. On the other hand, the devil is the source of murder and the father of lies. There is no truth in the devil. When he lies, he speaks very naturally and fluently. It sounds like it's true, and people are often deceived by his lies. The idea that we can enjoy sin without consequence is one of his effective lies. The concept of evolution that denies God is another of his lies. Spiritually speaking, we are children either of God or of the devil, depending on who we listen to. Which father we belong to is most important to each of us. If we belong to the devil, we cannot hear the truth and believe. But if we belong to God, we hear the truth, believe the truth, and obey the truth. Jesus said in John 18, 37, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. In our times, people often misunderstand the church of Jesus Christ. They think that as it embraces all kinds of people, it should allow all kinds of ideas to circulate freely. But that is not what the Bible teaches. Paul said that God's household is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. If the church does not stand on the truth, it will not stand. This is why the devil attacks with clever lies. In the world, people cheat and are being cheated. They deceive and are being deceived. And they think it's normal. And that's what everybody should do. And wherever we go, that's what we do. But in the church, we must speak the truth in love. 
We must preserve the truth, guard the truth, and proclaim the truth. So we have to discern what is God's truth and what is the devil's lie. Those who seek to tear down and destroy the body of Christ are doing the devil's work. No matter how good their words may sound. God's work is life-giving work through the truth of his word. It always gives life, always builds up, and brings unity to the body of Christ. Knowing the truth is not a light matter. We all need to know the truth. When we know the truth, we have real freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from death. And when we as a church guard the truth and proclaim it, the church is strengthened and the kingdom of God advances. Let's hold to Jesus' teachings. Let's commit ourselves to listen to his word through deep Bible study, one-on-one, -on -one, in groups, personally. Let's hold to Jesus' teaching so that we may know the truth and have real freedom in Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus, who is the truth and teaches the truth. Thank you for your promise that when we hold to your teaching, we will know the truth and the truth sets us free. Please help each and every one of us listen carefully to your word with humble hearts, with full attention, with earnestness to really hear your voice speak to us. Please fill each of our hearts with the word of God from above and help us stand in these times in the truth of your word. Please bless our community to be strong in the truth of your word. And please advance your kingdom and spread the gospel, especially to students on our campuses. Help many students come to Jesus and have true freedom in Jesus. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.